Good afternoon, my name is Seth Limbaugh, and welcome to our class on shooting a scene, uh, filmmaking basics. Uh, a little bit about myself, my name is uh, Seth, as I said. Uh, I work at the Rutherford County Library System, um, and I also have a degree and background in video production and filmmaking. Um, so, with that being said, today we're going to be going over uh, how to shoot a scene, uh, what we're going to be going over the basics of shots. We're going to be talking about uh, shot, like what, what uh, different shot types, um, as well as camera movements and things like that. Uh, we're also going to kind of talk about how to achieve these things uh, with your camera and the scene and positioning and um, everything like that. So, with that being said, uh, we're going to delve right into that information. Uh, here we go. Um, also, we're going to talk a little bit about some software uh, that you can use to help you while shooting a scene and, and things like that, uh, some storyboard software, stuff like that. So uh, so now to begin the class, uh, we are first looking at this image here. Uh, this is an example of an extreme wide shot. Uh, an extreme wide shot is a shot that is panned very far back. They're also usually called establishing shots. Uh, establishing shots kind of establish the scene, the location. Uh, it would be uh, so. This is an extreme wide shot of, of a looks like a storm coming in on, on people. So you kind of get the idea of the big open barrenness. Another example of extreme wide shot would be uh, going in like a shot of an entire cityscape. Uh, that would be an extreme wide shot uh, that's commonly used to establish locations, things like that. Uh, so that kind of covers an extreme wide shot. Almost every film opens usually with extreme wide shots, or if they don't, they're like, uh, after their opening little scene, they will open with that. But uh, most locations, especially large locations, will open with extreme wide shots to give you kind of a look and feel of what's in the area, what's around, uh, what, what the production wants you to uh, see. Uh, to achieve an extreme wide shot, you want to have your camera back as far as possible uh, to get uh, the full framing of everything. Um, you want everything uh, for this you don't have to worry about the rule of thirds which we will talk about a little bit later um, so uh, you just want to get as much of your content as you can into the shot uh, so we'll move on to the next one Oops. next we just have a wide shot so this is means the camera goes in a little bit more and you're going to see a trend in this uh, as to the order that I'm doing them in um, this establishes a scene as well, um, but this kind of establishes more of the, the, it, it, the establishing shot establishes more of the world, the wide shots establish more of a scene. Uh, so you've got your world establishment in the first shot, and then a wide shot would establish a scene. So you know the action is going to be taking place in a wide shot area, or you can see kind of what's going on in the immediate vicinity of, of everything in the action. Uh, next on the list we have uh, this is a full shot. A full shot shows an actor from head to toe. Um, this is what we've got here. Uh, the rule of thirds, we'll talk about that now, um, is pretty solid. So or the rule of thirds means you split your frame up into three places and you want your attention to be focused on one of those three places. So over here we've got the, this big tree is in the first third. And we've got our actor in the second third, and the third third, there's some background going on right here with this uh, extra. Um, so this is kind of split up to where the rule of thirds, your eyes are drawn immediately to here, but there's still something to look at here and something to look at here if your eyes were to dart away. Um, so yeah, full shot establishes uh, your full character. It, it's head to toe character uh, to allow you to see and visualize exactly uh, who they are, um, what they are, uh, if they are approaching somebody, uh, it can show an immediate approach, things like that. Uh, the next thing we've got is a medium full shot, so that takes the full shot but goes in a little bit more, usually down to around the knees. Um, so we've got this shot here. Um, and so what's funny or, or, or interesting is I was going to talk about headroom uh, in the next. So headroom means you want to have a little bit of space between the, the actor's head and the end of the camera frame. You don't want their head to be like right up against the frame here, or you don't want it to be way too far up. You want to leave about like an inch of width here between your actor and the top of the frame. Uh, that's called headroom. Next shot, so 
there's headroom for the main actor, or not the main actor, the tallest actor here, and so they've used the they've used the tallest actor as the reference point for headroom, uh, and then everyone else is different. Now, if this actor was gone and you were looking at this image, uh, this would look off to to a lot of people uh, because there would be way too much headroom for for these actors here to to be able to to, to see. So you'd want uh, you would want to make sure that you're always about one inch uh, of of shot, or one inch about a, a one inch on the frame, right around there, one or two inches. Um, and again, this is just a medium full shot. It shows about from knees up, um, and uh, covers covers that. Next, we got is a cowboy shot, is what they call it. Uh, this is used frequently, and it's originated. It, it's used a lot in westerns, but it can be used in other things. Um, this right here, it means basically you take it from around where a, where a holster would be on a cowboy. From there up is what a cowboy shot uh, is. So it's, it's around like thigh level uh, going up um, with the actor. Um, and so that is that framing. Uh, it's frequently used for approach. Uh, it's used for suspense. Um, it, it's used if, if someone is walking towards the camera a lot. Uh, you'll, you'll see this shot. Uh, it's it's very much used for I think movement more more so than, than anything else. A medium shot. So this is about chest up. Um, once again, we've got another good good example of headroom right here. Um, a chest uh, medium shot shows uh, chest up is a little bit closer. You get more details on the actor's face. It's it's more from whereas here we were focusing on full bodies, full bodies, full bodies. Uh, medium shots, now we're starting to close in and focus on the actor's face, their intentions, uh, what they're looking for, and things like that. Um, also, I forgot to go over how to achieve uh, uh, these these shots. So we'll, uh, whoa, things have taken a small, there we go, okay. To achieve these shots, it's are very simple. Uh, to achieve this shot, you just make sure you get the whole actor in frame. To achieve this, you go knees up. Uh, bring the camera in closer. We talked about that's the holster. It's a medium shot. You want to shoot about chest level up. You want to bring the camera all the way in uh, to make sure that uh, you've got that pretty close up. Um, now we've got a medium close up. Uh, this is now we're delving definitely into uh, facial expressions uh, and facial acting. Um, so this is you want to shoot from about the shoulders up. Headroom, uh, you want less headroom than before, whereas before there's been about an inch of headroom. This is where you want just to give yourself just a little bit on medium close-ups uh, because you want to make sure that you're maximizing your frame usage here uh, to get as much in as you can with, uh, with the actor in the frame here. Um, and then next we've got is a close-up. Uh, this is where the headroom does not matter anymore. You don't worry about headroom here. You want to just focus on the primary actor's face. Uh, I would say from like eyebrows down to chin. Uh, you want you want the parts of the face that give the most expression. Uh, uh, that's what a good close up can do. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of intent in actor's eyes um, and a lot of intent in of course their mouth uh, and movement with that and their their jaw lines. Um, but uh, there's a lot that can be done with an actor's eyes. Another thing, a trick, an actor trick, uh, is that um, when you're an actor and you're l looking at another character uh, and you don't want your movement to seem static, uh, is to uh, look at one eye and then look at their other eye back and forth. And you do that at an okay, p like depending on the pace of that, depends on how kind of frantic you want to look, but it'll make your eyes kind of move and transition back and forth just a little bit. Uh, and that can give you a different sense of emotion based on how fast you do that. Uh, of course, more rapidly being more panicked, anxiety filled, and slower being more intense, maybe love filled, uh, something like that. Um, and so something to practice with with your actors if you're working uh, with close-ups especially. Uh, that's a good, uh, a good little secret tip that uh, I've got. Now we've got extreme close-ups. Uh, that's exactly what it says. You are just right in there. Um, and of course, this is where that eye tip I was just telling you about. I should have saved it for this image because uh, this is a perfect example of that. Um, but uh, you would, uh, like, if, if you're, you're just focusing on their eyes and eye movement, uh, having them look at an actor across the way or having them just look at two different objects. Because sometimes when you're at this 
close of a, of a thing, the camera is like right up on you. Um, and so for that to work, uh, the actor who they're acting with is off camera or not standing exactly where they should be standing, just either giving their lines or sometimes it's not even the actor, it's a PA or someone else giving the lines and that audio is mixed in or dubbed in later. Uh, so they sometimes will have markers or a crew person will hold up uh, like a pen or like a, like a pen or, or, or a ball or something and tell them where to look at. So that way they've got a focal point on where they're supposed to be looking for continuity's sake. Um, and things like that uh, for, for all of the continuity. Um, now we got some images. Uh, these are some different types of shots. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say this. These images from here on out are from boards.com, B-O-O-R-D-S.com. Uh, that is a screenwriting software that I have discovered that helps you do uh, storyboarding uh, and, and uh, plan out your shots for your production. Um, it looks really interesting. I've never been able to use it because uh, I, I don't do a lot of storyboarding. But if you love storyboards, I would highly recommend you use it. And shout out to them for this really helpful, these really helpful images on their website uh, that I was able to uh, use for this program. Um, so this is called an upshot. Uh, this shot right here uh, will give you a view, like a helicopter view of going up, looking down at your actor, straight directly down. Um, this is a more, these are more trick shots that we're doing here, so uh, this is just a cool one to establish, uh, to establish kind of an area maybe, a, a sense of loneliness if you can, or a sense of urgency. Uh, there's a lot of different uses that you can use an upshot for. Uh, next one is, whoops, did we pass down shots? Oh, sorry, this is a down shot. I am so sorry, not an upshot. This is looking down. <laughs> Uh, this is an upshot. Uh, okay, so yeah, this is a down shot. This is a shot looking down at uh, uh, at, at somebody. I'm sorry, I meant I meant it the other way around. Uh, then we've got this. This is an upshot. So this is you looking up. Uh, the camera is placed down very low, angled upwards towards the actor um, to give them a sense of like it'll it'll make them appear taller, uh, which kind of will give them a sense of confidence, a sense of importance, a power. Uh, uh, things like that. So you want to use that for more intense scenes, something that you want to display very confidently, very powerful, uh, very intense moments like that. Um, this is a point of view shot. Uh, this is a shot from the first person perspective of the, of the uh, actor. Um, a lot of times the actor isn't even there in a first person shot. Uh, this, of course, there's a dog here in this frame here. But a lot of times first person shots are shot with just the camera. The actor is not actually there at all with the camera. Um, and it's shot from their perspective. So it's shot at their height level, things like that. Um, first person shots are great uh, for uh, just establishing some, like, bringing you into the character's world, immersing you in their world, immersing you into the... Uh, to kind of bring you into the character that you've been watching. Um, it can also add a layer of suspense because uh, if you're in a action scene or, or a scary movie and you're in a first person view, you can't see what's coming, you see exactly what they see, uh, and that can add a layer of anxiety and suspense to your film if you're going that route with it as well. Um, the next one on the list is an uh, over the shoulder shot. Uh, this is used very frequently in filmmaking. Uh, it is where you have the camera placed over the shoulder of one actor so you can kind of see their mouth uh, and it's them looking at the other actor. Uh, you'll see this frequently used on, uh, on, uh, on soap operas, television shows, almost any type of TV show you will see this uh, heavily, heavily used on. Um, this is the, one of the most common shot types. So you'll want to, uh, you'll want to use this frequently. Um, you do not, th there is a rule with over the shoulder shots, which is the 180 degree rule, uh, which oh, I wish I had a diagram for. Um, but uh, the 180 degree rule is, I'm gonna draw it out for you. Uh, let's see. So you got the camera, you've got your actor, the nose, actor, the nose. So the camera is shooting here. Okay. Alright, so, I don't know if y'all can see this or not, but, uh, there we go. So, 
the camera is shooting over the shoulder. You can move that camera anywhere in the semicircle over here. It can go anywhere you want, but it can't go past 180 degrees in one direction. Uh, so you can, if, you, if you're shooting a shot and you have different, different frames you want to do, so you want to do one over the shoulder, you want to do one medium shot to get both actors in the frame, uh, then that, and then you want to go back to over the shoulder, that's fine, but you don't want to go over the shoulder from the other direction, because if you do that, it's going to, all of a sudden, everyone who watches it is going to think that the two people have swapped sides, because it's going to look different. So you can't go 180 degrees past your establishing shot. Uh, you always want to stay 180 degrees over there. The exception to this is if you show the transition. So if you show the camera moving from point A going all the way around to point B and then it stays there, then you can move to that side of the screen. But you can't jump cut past 180 degrees without, uh, without some sort of direct intention for it to look strange because it will look very strange. Um, we established the upshot. So that's kind of our shot list. Now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, camera movement uh, and things like that. So the first camera movement, and once again, these are from boards.com, B-O-O-R-D-S.com. Uh, so uh, this camera movement here is a uh, we're t zooming, zooming in and out. This is taking the actual camera zoom lens and going in and out with it. This is not pushing in and out. This is using an actual zoom lens. So this is taking the camera lens, twisting it, and zooming in and out, not not pushing in and out. Um, this is an older, the, people don't use Zoom much anymore. They used it very frequently uh, back in like, I guess the 80s, 90s. Uh, but now they do push more in and out. Zoom looks a little bit cheesier these days uh, as, opposed to, as opposed to the push. Um, but this is an example of Zoom. Uh, this is an example of panning. Uh, panning is you have the camera in one direction and you just turn. Uh, so you see how, how that's that's going there. So that's uh, that's panning left and panning right. Uh, so that is that is panning. Uh, panning is good to establish uh, something around the corner, something right off screen. Uh, an actor hears a noise and you go, oh no, what's that? And then it pans to look. Um, and that's kind of what's going on here. Uh, it's it's good for a reveal. Uh, is what a pan is really good for. Uh, here's the tilt. Uh, tilt up and tilt down. Um, so tilting is the same thing. Camera tripod is stationary. Camera tilts up. Camera tilts back down. Uh, those are that, that's tilting. Um, this can be used to same reason for the pan. It's good for revealing something. Just revealing something above you or below you. Uh, same same usage. All right. Now we've got dolly in and dolly out. So this is now the, what I was talking about, so now uh, from the first one. So this is different from a zoom because the camera itself is actually going in physically and out physically. It's not a lens be trick, it's just a camera going in and a camera going out. Uh, that is, the, and this is more standard now uh, in, in filmmaking, is, is our dollying in and dollying out. Um, this looks smoother. Uh, your depth of field uh, stays the same usually as long as you've got a fo follow focus happening, uh, all of that. So, so this is the this this is a good definition of dollying in, dollying out. Uh, now trucking, trucking right and trucking left. Uh, so this is different from a pan because instead of the camera just panning over, this is the camera moving. So it's the same thing as the that we just saw with with uh, with the dolly. Is it, except it just it goes it goes sideways so it goes like this or like this, um, and uh, it's a good it's a good another good use for a reveal. I think it's a preferred use of the reveal. Uh, I would rather reveal things like this than, than using a pan, but I think that's just my preference. Um, feel free to use any of these. Of course, they're all legitimate film techniques. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, trucking. Uh, Pedestal. Uh, pedestal is taking the camera and instead of tilting up and down, uh, pedestal is just taking the camera and actually raising it up and raising it down. Uh, this is a, once again, same thing for revealing. You can use it to reveal something above or below you, uh, but instead of it being a, a tilt and at an angle, it's just the camera is dropping straight down, but everything is still looking straight ahead uh, in the frame. And that is kind of the list of uh, all of the camera movements. 
So now let's talk a little bit about shooting a scene and what goes into shooting a scene. Um, we don't really have any more diagrams to show. I'm just going to kind of leave these up. You know what? We'll, 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 let's go back to one of these. And we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about this scene. So we've talked we've talked a little bit about lighting in the past um, and how how that that goes into play. So this is a, an example of natural lighting. Um, so now let's talk about all the crew production people, where they'd stand, um, and what's what's kind of going on behind the scenes here. So one, I can't say for certain because all productions are different, and I don't have like any insight into this particular scene or film. Uh, as to how they shot it, but just my guess on certain things and like wh where if it were me where I would put certain things, uh, we'll, we'll go over that. Um, so in this scene, there's probably, so there's this shadow here. So this shadow is either natural or fake. I can't tell if it, it's really hard to tell if this is a fake or not. But if it is fake, there is an actor, or not an actor, a uh, the person over here holding, or, or probably two people, holding up a very large uh, uh, cookie cutter that is blocking the sun uh, from the scene or diffusing it. There's also, so that way he's more in the shadows and the light is more controlled. So there's definitely some diffusion happening over there. Um, also in the scene you're going to have your sound guy. Uh, they're going to be holding a boom mic. Uh, it's a boom mic is a pole with a very, it's, it's a very long pole with a microphone at one end. And on the other end is all of your, uh, is your, your sound stuff. I use a Zoom recorder, uh, and it plugs into an XLR cable that runs all the way up the boom pole to the microphone. Uh, you're, you're, you want a, probably a condenser mic for this. Um, so the audio guy is standing off to the frame, like probably behind the camera here. The boom pole is extended very far across the way and is dangling right above this actor's head right here. Uh, so he's just up there with that. If you are running a boom mic and you are a if you are a boom op, you are going to have some good arm muscles uh, <laughs> eventually uh, because your day will be very tiring. You spend most of your day holding up a big pole and keeping it as steady as possible for a very long time. Um, but that's where I would say the boom op is. Uh, obviously, the camera person is where is where we're seeing it. They're probably about with this shot. I'd say they're probably about twenty feet away from the actor. Um, depth of field is uh, whoops, uh, the whoops the aperture on this. Uh, let's see, large depth of field. Just one second. Uh, so, I would, so there's, uh, we're going to talk a little bit, I'm going to pause for a second to talk a little bit about camera aperture and exposure and depth of field. So, do I have a good example? Ah, oh, yeah. So this right here is, uh, this right here is, is, a, is a pretty large depth of field. You can see the actors in the background, they're not blurry. You can see these trees going all the way back, they're not blurry. But you're at a medium shot, or a... Uh, you're the full shot here, so so you can still see everything. So I would say that that's a, a, a pretty large depth of field. However, here you've got more of a shallow depth of field because as you can see behind her, all the trees are blurred out. There, you can't really make out details on anything here. So to achieve that, uh, that depends on something called your aperture on your camera, which is a thing that you can turn. It's uh, and uh, you, the aperture. The, it depends on so depending on how close you get and how far in you zoom on your zoom lens, you focus in and out. So by zooming in and out, that gives that opens and closes your aperture on your lens. Uh, essentially, if you're going in and out. So there's f stops. Um, f 1.4 is a, a very large aperture. Uh, lets in tons of light, so your aperture is open. It's letting in tons of sunlight to capture the image. Uh, that gives you a very thin, thin depth of field. Uh, something along the lines of this right here probably not probably this is still even uh, this something this this is what it gives along there's no you can't see anything but the actor's face uh, so this is a large aperture this is an f1.4 probably an f-stop 1.4 uh, lets in lots of lights then depth of field um, there's 1.4 2.0 2.8 4.0 5.6 8.0 11.0 
are the, the primary aperture settings. Um, all that going from 1.4 being a large aperture letting in a lot of light and the spin depth of field here to 22 being very small uh, letting in uh, uh, letting in very little light but you have a depth of field where you can see all the way back kind of like in this shot here you can see even details in the mountains all the way back there um, so here we're about uh, I'd say I'd say we're small so I'd say this is like an f stop 11 to 16 somewhere in there you can mostly see all that in the background um, and that kind of covers uh, uh, that so so yeah well, let's just go through all of them and see what what we think they look like so this is uh, not a good depth of field here uh, or oops, sorry no not, not a good one it's hard to tell this this looks 90% CGI so uh, a 99% CGI so all of it was done digitally so there's there's no real camera tricks to do this one uh, the probably the only things that might even be real are these vehicles down here uh, and then everything else and like the, the desert here but everything else is fake um, but you can still see details in the cloud so I would say that this is uh, uh, a pretty large depth of field uh, so I'd say it's in between an f-stop 11 to 22. Uh, we already talked about that one, we talked about this one. Um, this one is hard to tell because the actors are so close in that it doesn't really matter. I'd say it's probably moderate, I'd say it's probably an f5.6 to 8 maybe, I, I could be wrong, I'm not sure about this one. Uh, they're standing so so close to their background that it's really hard to see uh, what that would look like. Uh, we've talked about this one already being um, being a relatively thin depth of field, so I'd say it's an f 2.0 to 2.8. Uh, this one is oh, there's some detail back there. I'd say it's moderately thin depth of field. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I'd say moderate. So I'd say about 4.0. So here's a good example of one. Um, uh, so, and to achieve this, so to achieve this, I wish that I could give you a practical look at this. So, the closer you are to your, your subject with the camera, the, the, uh, the, the, the thinner the depth of field. So, they're pretty close with the camera right now to make the background blurry and have him be at the forefront of it. The, the camera is pretty close to the subject. Now if they wanted you to see everything in the background, what they would do is they would pull the camera back and then you would then use the camera zoom lens to zoom in a little bit to where you wanted to and then adjust your uh, your, your exposure. Alternatively, you'd use a different lens uh, or something of that nature to adjust. Uh, I have a wide shot lens that I use to get really thin depth of field shots that I like kind of like that close up that you saw. Uh, you have to go really far back with the subject because it's automatically zoomed in really far but uh, it looks really good. Uh, so you, really you need multiple lenses to achieve all of these effects really well. Oh. Okay, so we have gone over and we've done that. Should close up. There's no telling with this. This is probably using. Uh, this is probably uh, actually a very thin. I would say. I would personally would say that this is going to be an f22 with a. Uh, not f22. An f1.4 to with the zoom lens, uh, and to where it's just a very thin depth of field. Unless he's moving a lot. If he's moving his head a lot, then not because he would be going in and out of focus way too easily. And in which case, that would be achieved by bringing the camera in closer instead. Um, because yeah, if it's closer to you, yeah. So so, I work on that. I really, once again, wish that uh, unfortunately due to COVID, I was we were unable to to go actually go out in the field and, and shoot some of this stuff for you. But uh, I do wish that I had been able to get some of that for you because it would be a lot easier to explain that way. Um, but that's okay. Um, let's see, achieving well, uh, ways to achieve some of these trick shots. We can talk about that for a second. Um, the uh, the down shot here, so this can be done using either a crane. Uh, you can uh, there's tons of ways you can do this. You can use a crane. Uh, you can if you're if you're on a on a low budget, you can attach your camera 
uh, they make these tripod mounts that you can buy that let you, they basically let you attach, they're like the, what is it, the little uh, workbench uh, things, clamps, that's the word I'm looking for, they're like clamps, and they'll clamp onto anything, so you can clamp it on to like a pole, or just clamp it onto the ceiling, a ceiling fan, something like that, and uh, then you've got your camera set up for uh, a down shot. Uh, of course, if you have the money, you can use a drone, a helicopter, dolly, or a uh, dolly crane, uh, other other things like that that are maybe a bit more expensive uh, that might not work out for you. Um, point of view shots, uh, the camera person just replaces the subject. Uh, sometimes these are used, uh, uh, like some of these are, these are more handheld things. So if you notice in some shots, uh, some shots like if a camera is moving uh, in its point of view, it's very smooth. Uh, they're on a glide mount where it, there's a weight that balances the camera, and it's if you like jerk or jolt around, the weight counterbalances you and makes up for it, so that the jerkiness never shows on the screen. It just balances. Now, if you're doing a first-person point of view, you're probably not going to be using that type of a mount because realistically, when we walk, our head bobs, our moves. So you're going. If you're in first person, it's very likely going to have. Uh, those weights are not going to be all the if they if you, they are wearing one they're not wearing one all the way so that way it doesn't uh, take away the illusion of movement uh, and things like that. Um, we've talked about the 180 degree rule over the shoulder shots, um, things like that. Um, talked about up shots. Talked about zoom in and out. Um, and so now all of these are standard uh, single camera styles of filmmaking. Uh, however, if you if you look at sitcoms, you will notice that most sitcoms are mostly shot with full shots, and there is a reason for that. Uh, the reason that they are mostly full and wide shots is because they are using a multi-camera setup. Uh, usually, they're in front of a live studio audience for the laughs, uh, and they have one to two camera. Not one to two. They have two to three cameras sitting placed, uh, one on the left side, one on the right side, one in the middle, um, placed filming everything and all of the action all at once. Uh, and it's all going into Avid, which or, or another uh, uh, editing software. I think it's Avid. Um, but uh, it's all going into to software and being recorded. Sorry. It's all being recorded so that way in later in post-production, all three cameras will sync up and then the editors will choose when to transition the camera from A to B to C. Sometimes it's done in real time in a studio, uh, in a control room. It just depends on what sit the sitcom is. But sitcoms follow that 180 rule to a T because they have the set on one side of the of the thing and then all production crew is on the other side. So they've got 180 degrees to move the two cameras and center camera kind of around in and then they just can't cross over to the other side uh, at all. Uh, and that's, that's how sitcoms are filmed. Everything else is shot usually scene by scene with a single camera set up uh, and everything that we've looked at today. Uh, and those utilize all of these other types of shots. Um, so I think that kind of covers the basics of shooting a scene. Uh, we've gone over uh, all the different shot types. We've gone over camera movement styles. We've talked a little bit about how uh, the scenes are achieved and we've also kind of talked about what sitcoms look like versus uh, traditional single camera, single camera versus multi-camera uh, shooting. Um, so I think at this point I'm going to open up the floor to questions. Uh, if you have any, um, please feel free to uh, shoot them our way in the, in the chat box and uh, thank you so much for attending the class. There we go, there we go. Ah, all right, got my microphone back on. Um, so thank you all for attending the class um, today. If you have questions, feel free to leave them in the chat box now. Uh, I'll answer our first question that's already been asked. Uh, if I'm doing a multi-cam setup, should both cameras be the same brand type of camera? What if they're different frame rates? 
Uh, to answer that question, uh, so ideally, yes, you would want the same type of camera, the same brand of camera that would give you consistency in the look of the of a, of a, of the shot. And when you're editing in between shots, uh, it is possible to do it with two different types and brands of cameras. Uh, it just puts more work on the editor to kind of color correct and match up the, the shots and then kind of how that looks, the look and feel. Um, but if you can, please, it is better to have the same type of camera. Um, frame rates. You need to shoot both contents at the same frame rate, either at 24 uh, point 0.9 or 30 frames per second. If you're shooting film, uh, like a, a cinematic thing, you want to go for 24.9. If you're shooting more of a sitcom and multicam style, uh, you're wanting to look more at 30. Um, and that's just kind of standard for look and feel of, of, of those two types of uh, uh, films. Um, you want them to be at the same frame rates. If they are at different frame rates, the frames will be out of sync. You will not be able to sync up your footage uh, unless you uh, convert or drop frames down, uh, and that uh, I'll do that. Uh, <laughs> another question is: Is it okay to fix everything in post? Right? Uh, that is the joke in the film world: is that uh, if you can't do it on, if you can't do it in production, it'll be it'll be fixed in post. But that is a not a great rule of thumb to go by. Uh, ideally, you do not want. Uh, uh, to have to rely on everything to be fixed in post uh, because your editor will, will in fact hate you uh, <laughs> by the time they are they are done with it and they get to it. All right, we got any other questions? While we're waiting to see if there are any other questions to wrap up with, uh, there is uh, one last uh, part of the filmmaking basics class that I'll be teaching. The next one will be uh, editing a scene. Uh, that'll be on this Friday and next Wednesday. So uh, we look forward to having you out for that. Uh, with that being said, I don't see any other questions. So I guess we're going to go ahead and call it early here. Uh, thank you all for attending, and I look forward to seeing you.